Right guys, we're here, so we've got Vent, we've got Aaron, there's Aaron with his mask off. We've got Jack, who just like seems to be some sort of weird fucking young rocker. <laughs> Jack's had his first drink today. And we, yeah, we've first drink ever in his life. So we've had a couple of whiskies because we said we were going to buy a very expensive bottle of whiskey. Um, but we just wanted to sample it, and we've had a couple of pints because Vent made us do it. Just um, and we're about to wait for our flight over to Krakow. So uh, we'll check in with you later. Peace. So we're here now. We've just landed in Krakow Airport. And we are just waiting for our transfer to come in his minibus, hopefully. And over to the hotel in a bit. So we've made it to the hotel and we're on the beer. We're not going to have too many because we've got to be up tomorrow. Well, we haven't got to be up early tomorrow, have we now? So, yeah, because Vent's, um, Vent's tour that is organised is not happening until midday. 1.30 in the afternoon, so it's all changed, all changed this time. Oh yeah, we've got a full morning. Who will be first up? I'll be first up. You'll be first up? Yeah, we've got a gym in the morning. We might join you on that one. Yeah. Good morning, first day up. Look, loads of schools here. First day, first morning we got up, had a few bevies last night, had a good chat. And today we are off to, there we go, got it. So I was fit spoken out today for the visit and it's all about one o'clock so time for breakfast. So that's the vegan breakfast, so we'll see what it's like. It's Aaron trying to wake the other two up. The other two reprobates. And Auschwitz Museum is right across the road from us. Yeah, so we're gonna take a look at on the outside. So here's the hotel that we stayed at. The Imperial. Do you know who you're talking to? So guys, we're here now, outside, waiting to go into the museum. So, what are your thoughts before you go in? Apart from Aaron dropping his phone, glass side down. 
No thoughts? Appre apprehension. Apprehension, why? Yeah. Because it's something that I've known about all my life and now we're finally here. And yeah. Is, is it different seeing it with your own eyes rather than through a screen? Do you think? From what we've seen so far, 100%. Get a bit closer to it. You need to really get, get a close up. Oh, you're telling me how to film now? You, you. Now, Jack, you want me to get a bit closer? <laughs> yeah? Is this close enough? So, what are your thoughts on this? You're the youngest guy in the team. Um, yeah, just interested to learn and appreciate what happened here. Well, you can learn online, you, see, you can see it on TV, you can see it on, on the, what's... Doesn't what's, do it justice, though, so does it be in here? So, you, you seen with your own eyes is yeah, what it's, it's all same, about. It? Yeah? yeah? Not the same. Feeling the atmosphere, maybe. Yeah. That might be a thing. Yeah, it always is better to see things with your own eyes. Definitely. I think we live in a society where we see everything through a screen at the moment, so... I think, Dan, um, I said it in the site, but just thinking that where we're stood here, there's probably Jewish people stood here, and we're going to go through and yeah. follow the whole trail. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so anyway, we'll get back to you shortly. So guys, you'll notice that we're all wearing earphones here. This is not for translation. The guy taught in English to us. He was really good. But the reason behind the earphones is that the guide will talk very quietly into a microphone and we can hear him clearly. And this is to keep uh, an air of solemnness to the, to the camp, to uh, respectful quietness. After all that happened in this place, which was extremely bad, extremely bad. So a little bit of a history on this place. This is Auschwitz I, and this was originally a Polish army barracks and horse breaking yard. And when the Germans invaded Poland, they took over this place and used it as a prisoner of war camp for Polish and later on Russian prisoners of war and also for political opponents and dissidents. So originally they were housing prisoners of war, not Jews. And later on they, they began the, con the construction of um, Auschwitz II, which is Auschwitz-Birkenau, which we'll be seeing later. And again, this wasn't really an extermination camp for Jews. It was built to hold Russian prisoners of war. In fact, 10,000 Russian prisoners of war helped build Auschwitz-Birkenau. 9,000 of which died through the work and exhaustion and lack of food. So this place was the start of the final solution. They decided to try and find an alternative method of murdering people without working them to death. And that was the first use of Zycon B in one of the cellars in one of these blocks. But then they realized that it would be a better idea to do it near the crematorium, a room at the side of the crematorium, which you, you will see later. And they actually did experiments there and found that Cyclone B, which is an insecticide, but in a confined area does kill humans. They found that if they used this, um, it would be more efficient and it would murder a lot more people um, at one, any one time. So this was the start of the final solution at this place. Later on, of course, it then moved over to um, Auschwitz-Birkenau. And um, we will be visiting that later. I am going to um, just leave back in tracks to the rest of this part of the video. So you can see everything inside and just take it all in.
Let me tell you, these buildings were used by the German army during the First World War operations 
they were just stables for horses, their advantage was that they could be very easily dismantled, you see, and, and, and big ready-made you know, parts, they were transported here by train, and then they were assembled very, very quickly, so that was the main, if not the only advantage of the buildings, you see. 52 horses could be uh, placed in a such a building, you know, during the First World War, during the Second World War, the same building without any improvement, you see, without any uh, changements, was used by uh, 500 people, four or 500 people, they were staying on a much bigger, much wider bandwidth, so there could be seven or eight people, you see, sleeping together, tightly one uh, at a, in a row. So it's the end of the day, we go back to sunny England tomorrow on the flight. We had a great flight over, we had a great time Friday night, sat and got to know each other a little bit more. Um, I mean first we've got Aaron from Manchester Pig Save, we've got Jack who I met at Manchester Pig Save, we've got Vent who's my co-conspirator in the um, farm infiltration business and of course it's me Grumpy Vegan Grandad. So, yeah, today was the day. Um, why did we want to come here and what have we got from it? Anybody can go first. Yeah, well I think for me I wanted to feel and bear witness and, and bear testimony to what had happened here. So that was my experience to come here and mm -hmm. see what happened here. So that's my motivation for but coming. Why why can you not just see it on TV? You can see it on TV, there's plenty of documentaries out there. Why did you want to come physically here? What do you think the difference is? Yeah, I think confronting any injustice is different and that affects you and changes you. And I, and I think for me today, uh, what I learned, I know this isn't a question, is that um, obviously I've experienced racism in my life and today I've learned that I've never, I've not experienced racism. Today I saw racism. At, uh, at its highest peak. That's racism. Mm. And for me that's a learning curve. Yeah. You know, to see what real racism looks like. But, I mean, I'd be, I'd be careful to choose my words because racism is relative mm. to the situation that you're in. I mean, for generations of, of immigrants into the UK, in the 70s when I was young, it was a terrible time for them. They were low paid, there was no minimum wage, they were paid peanuts, they were, there was racism on TV, there was racism. So it, it's, I know what you're saying, it, it's the worst of the worst because they actually murdered people for their religion. It's, However- It's based on that race. Yeah. It's, it's actually seen people separated by race. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and other mm. other dis other forms of discrimination, yeah. and to see that happening on that scale and the brutality of it, it, it just and that's the thing as well, isn't it? I mean, when you got to Birkenau, because there's two camps, there's 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 what we'll call Auschwitz One, and then there's Auschwitz Two. Auschwitz One was the original army camp that we've learned today, mm. and that got turned into a, into a, a death camp of sorts. The first first gas chamber was there, which we saw mm -hmm. uh, and witnessed. But what about the scale? Did the scale surprise you both when you got to, to the Birkenau? Yeah, so... It, it, it I was, mean, tell, tell people how big it actually was. So, so it's vast. Um, there was 100,000 Jews there at any given time. Um, would, you say, would you say it was the size of a small town? 
Yeah, yeah. I'd say it's the smallest yeah, town. It was, it was, uh, well, they got rid of villages, didn't they, to make way for it? That was another thing I didn't know, yeah, Jack. Didn't tell know us about either. that. Well, I just did. Yeah. Well, tell us what, what we got told. <laughs> Come on, tell us what we got told. I think it was a couple of villages that yeah, they, they sort of flattened. Really, was it about five, maybe? Five villages they just sort of and then decimated and made way for this yeah, big Yeah, they camp. reused the bricks, didn't they? Yeah. From the villages. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, it, it looks it looks huge as you're driving up, and you do get a sense of of, of scale. But when you think about how many people were, were there and how they were crammed together, it isn't so big. Mm. You know, when you're talking about you know approximately eight people to a bed. So there was what um, maybe. Was it about five or six hundred to a to a to I a think, shed? I think it's five hundred to a shed. Um, triple sort of tiered bed or bunk bed, if you like, um, and eight people per tier. So not concrete flooring either, was it? No. Um, one of the things he mentioned, the tour guide, was amazing. It was um, there was no grass there. It was all mud. Um, overflowing, disease, bacteria, people suffering with diarrhea, um, squalor. Yeah. So it's it's, uh, it's difficult to get your head around people being forced to endure those sorts of conditions. Yeah. Ooh. And I think there's an atmosphere as well, isn't there? There's yeah, definitely. there's a uh, you can't avoid it, can you? It, it's you, you could be the happiest person in the world. We could laugh and joke all the way there. We could walk through the archway laughing and joking and having the crap with each other, which we were doing in the hotel. Yeah, I think we were doing uh, it. Yeah. But as soon as you step onto that place, it, you realise what what this is all about. There's there's definitely something happens <coughs> inside you yeah. when when you walk onto I, that place. I, th I think part of that is that you can't comprehend it. No. So you. you, you you, like Aaron said, you're trying, you're trying, I think, to bear witness and acknowledge and pay respect. But I don't, I don't think we'll ever understand or comprehend something like that. And I guess by being there, um, I suppose, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the strangest thing was, was when we we walked from where the where the train carriage was, the cattle wagon. Yeah. The, that's what it is, the yeah. cattle wagon. Yeah. There was a cattle wagon and then we did that walk to the gas chamber. Yeah. And it was all about deception. And that's so, right. and we could actually, we actually talked about it, didn't we, Aaron, that as we're walking down there, we thought, we, 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 we could think, we're safe, we're on this tour, this tour guide is is taking us down here, but in reality, that was the deception. Yeah. He, that tour guide could quite easily have been one of the guards taking yeah. us down, and we are like looking around, going, "No, oh, it's not too bad. It's a big place. There's plenty of room." Yeah. We get down to the gas chamber, right, guys? Take your clothes off. We're just going to put you in the shower. Yeah. And that deception. Well, at least I think it, it was meticulous. He said they were meticulous. They were meticulous. Yeah, they were. Um, it's an excellent comparison, that, yeah. But it is, because when you're walking down there, you, there's no signs, is there? No. There's no sign of what, what went on there. No. Only because we, we know beforehand what went on there. But if I try to put myself in, in, into the head of the victim, and I, I, obviously there'd be people there in stripy uniforms, but you'd be, if you got dropped off there, you'd be looking around and there'd be nothing to give you a sign of what was coming your way no. whatsoever, would there? No, and I think when you get there though, you, when you get past that deception and you go into the huts, you can feel the energy. Yeah, you know? yeah. You can feel the energy on the post where people were tortured, you know, and there's a wall, isn't there, Ooh. where there's, there's, there's scratches of people yeah. trying, you know, trying to cling on to the life. And yeah. You can feel, you can feel that energy. And I think you obviously get one experience going in. But once you go through that whole hut yeah. and the gas chambers and everything, your experience changes. And on the way back, you don't see buildings, you see the people. Yeah, I, I felt that as well. I saw people. 
because it, it, I mean that's why I love my imagination it's a curse and sometimes it's a blessing but I, so yeah um, there's a lot to see there I mean I looked at it as well from an escapee point of view and I thought to myself how would I get out of here because it was so vast and I'm thinking it'd be easy to get out but then when you look at all the, the I was looking at how strategic the post towers were. So you've got electric fences, mm -hmm. then you've got a ditch, and then you've got another fence, and then another fence, and it's like, and then you've got the guard tower, guard tower, guard tower. There's just no way you were going to get out of that place, was there? No, and I don't even think people had the energy. You it's know. important to remember if you did get out, there'd be consequences for your family. For you, for the for rest your of friends, your, yeah, yeah. Consequences for mm -hmm. everyone. They'd make an example out of you. Yeah, that's what they said with, the, uh, with those hunger rooms. They basically starve you as, as punishment if one of your fellow sort of yeah. roommates or someone from. You know. Which part of the whole tour, Auschwitz 1, Auschwitz 2, which part of the tour hit you the hardest? We'll go with you first, Aaron. If you want to think about it, it set your time. It was definitely Auschwitz 2. Definitely. It was, it was, the scale was incredible and enormous. And then to actually physically go in and touch the objects, touch the beds, touch touch the poles. You know, there was a stake in the you know where they tortured people, mm -hmm. and to see those stakes, and you think the amount of people that had suffered on that on that wooden stake. Mm -hmm. That was Auschwitz one, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Auschwitz one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah interesting. But yeah, I was. But I think it was two where. Uh, was it two was where they get the, the scratches on the walls were? No, no that was one. Was that one? That was one, yeah. Well, I suppose maybe it was one then for me. Yeah, yeah. It was, I think it was that tactile. I think at that point I connected. So I think, I, as I said to Ben before, I think I went in trying not to be the tourist mm -hmm. and to try and to put myself in that place. And it, the, those things just force you, don't you? Yeah, think? yeah. Because, because as you saw in the video before, the, the, the scratches on the wall, people died at different rates and collapsed. and people were climbing on top of each other and the first thing you do when, you, when you're losing air is for some reason you want to climb up and the scratches on the wall were people trying to scramble up to get air you know it's, yeah it was really to put your hand to put your hand where someone had suffered yeah yeah to physically put your mm. energy with that negative energy mm. both Dan and I were doing yeah. that I know it's Dan and you were doing that and I, I was, I was yeah. taking my gloves off and doing, doing the same sort of thing just to try and make some sort of connection and well, while you're in the hot seat, what about you? What was what was the most impactful part for you? I think seeing the children's shoes. The children's and shoes. I, and I think that's because it made me think about my own children. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we can come back to scale um, the amount of shoes and you know lives that have been lost. Um, and then it sort of puts you into that mindset of. How would I feel if it were my children? You know, if, if I was having to take my clothes off with my children, mm -hmm. I'd get prepared to, you know, walk, walk to our deaths knowingly or well, unknowingly. Um, well, you'd be split off from your children to start with. The first thing well, yeah. you'd do would be you'd be on your own straight away. You'd be yeah. you'd be working, and um, it would be. It's so, awful to talk like this, though, isn't it? They said everyone under 14, didn't yeah. they? So mm. un under 14... He'd but it could be your cousin that you'd be getting in, in, yeah. in, in, in undressed under. So yeah, yeah, everybody in your town. Yeah. What about, you, what about you, Jack? I'd probably say the same. Probably the shoes and the hair really mm. sort of... It sent shivers down my spine when I sort of stood to appreciate like the individuals, you know. You sort of really focus on the individuals when you see the shoes and the hair. Mm as opposed to a general sort of holocaust you, yeah, you yeah. think about the, the individual victims when you, when you see the hair and the, the shoes it was I mean I'll have to agree because the, the reason I, I stopped at the shoes were, there were two reasons why I, why I sort of like the shoes got to me um, because there were masses of them weren't they mm -hmm. yeah. the first reason it was, was it, it was one thing my dad told me about and of course my dad died in September it was, he'd been to Auschwitz before and he told me about the shoes, he said oh, all the shoes and they were like different kinds. But another thing, the reason it got to me, was at our house there's, there's two lads, well, obviously Tyler's away, but there's two lads, there's me, there's Mrs. So of course they've all got three, four pair of trainers apiece, I've got f 
buy a, a fair pair of shoes and boots and work and everything. And they're in a pile. They're always in a pile. My missus puts them straight, and, but they always end up in a pile. And I just saw that pile and I just thought of home straight away. And it, it's yeah. that connection. Yeah. And also, what watching stuff on TV doesn't give you is, is the colours and, and textures. And I saw women's shoes that have been so beautifully done and beautiful colours, you know, and that got to me as well because it's like, look, they were proud of themselves. They were, they weren't, you know, you always think of it as in black and white. Yeah, it's true. You think of the war in black and white and you think of it as poor people, you know, Roman and gypsies were poor, but they weren't. They made the best of what they had. They made beautiful shoes and like with all colours and bright and happy and yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. And, and I think walking into that gas chamber was, was tough as well. With the uh, crematorium. You know, it just, it just looked at the machinery. Made for, to do a job. Made to do one particular job. Burn bodies yeah. and get rid of them. It's just mad, isn't it? I think he said they were burning three, 300 a day. 300 a day. And that, and that wasn't efficient enough. Plus it was sort of a makeshift gas chamber, wasn't it? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't underground. Yeah, it was the first. So, it was the first one in 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 Auschwitz one. The first one they did sort of set up. So it was like an experimental. One. Well, they tried the first experimental gas chamber in in, the car, in, in Block Eleven. Right. Okay. In the cellar of Block Eleven, right. where the cells were. They tried the Cyclone B experiments there. Right. What you're talking about is the first sort of gassing. Right, they, yeah, they, yeah. They did, they've got this mobile van, didn't they? And That's right, yeah. Yeah. The thing is, is that, I mean, that was horrendous seeing that. But then you think, even before the horrendous death, their, their day to day, their best day, their work, you know, their best day is, when you think about that, sleeping in a, in a, in a barracks with three, four hundred people and they're sharing bunks and people have got diarrhea. And yeah. coming down. Oh God! Yeah. And, you know, you you think that's their best day. Mm. That someone might have died. Yeah. And they've taken that body away, and that person's you know might have gone from the bottom and moved up a couple yeah. of bumps. Yeah. yeah. And then you start at the bottom, don't you? Yeah. Wow. And that's that's that, that's a normal day. Mm. You know. So we we saw the horrific stuff. Yeah, yeah. But the, every day was yeah. unimaginable. Yeah. Working parties. Right. Well, brilliant guys. I mean, all we've got left to do now is jump on that plane and, and get home. Yeah, but thanks for accompanying me and thanks for um, thanks for talking on my video. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. pleasure.